which out of the five stages of the marketing funnel do you think marketers tend to underestimate? The marketing funnel, the journey that we take each and every potential customer is one that is well known to most marketers. From brand awareness into consideration, conversion, loyalty and advocacy, we're building a relationship and a journey. However, most marketers tend to forget and underestimate one specific stage. And today, Marketing Max is going to tell us more about that and how we can solve that problem. Yes, I'm very excited today. I'm fangirling a bit because I'm a big fan of Max and what he has built with his newsletter, Growth Daily, as well as his businesses. He's going to talk about the inception of Growth Daily as a newsletter, as well as how he built it to a six-figure business and machine. He is a serial entrepreneur and a creator after all, so he definitely has had experiences with fails and successes, and it's not going to hold back today which means I really hope you're gonna enjoy this conversation where we're gonna talk about some actionable tactics, the importance of being clear over clever, as well as things like the rule of fifth and one of my favorite, favorite nuggets of wisdom that I've heard in a very long time, which is the $5 retargeting campaign, which means notepad or notes app at the ready because today is gonna be a goodie. We're gonna kick off our conversation talking about weddings and music and I promise, I'm going to be able, as always, masterfully to bring it back into marketing. So how about we get started? Let's kick off today's conversation and may today's class begin. I have a random question that I want to ask you now because it came into my head. What is your power song? That's a random question, Max. I'm just going to dive straight into it. But what is your power song? Is there a song that you really like to listen to when you want to get hyped up? So I love EDM music. I'm obsessed with EDM and I don't drink coffee. So there's this uh, inside joke with me and my friends and my yoga teacher and my wife that I don't drink coffee in the mornings. I take a shower listening to EDM. I think anything that's EDM that has a really high BPM, beats per minute beat, I, I love. I love. So anything EDM related. My all-time favorite EDM DJ is Madion, this amazing French DJ. He just brings me joy and, and pure happiness. But yeah, literally any EDM song. Lately, I've been listening to a lot of like Sophie Tucker remixes and Fisher. But yeah, e EDM. So how how much of your of your kind of wedding playlist was EDM? Did you actually put some in it or did you have to go with like the crowd pleasers? Because that's not what I'm honestly wondering about. <laughs> yeah, so we found this amazing band that calls themselves an electronic band. Or they have like a 10 piece, you know, band, normal band with like drums and guitars and four singers. But then they also have a DJ that's playing EDM tracks as like a background to the band that's playing live. And then they mix in EDM songs in between uh, more popular like Beyonce and Jay-Z and Kanye and all that fun stuff. My wife and I are very anti wedding music and wedding bands. So we, we had a pretty extensive no playlist, no journey, no Bruno Mars, no ain't no mountain high enough, none of that stuff. We we had pretty much all hip hop, rap, uh, and then EDM. And my wife really only loves EDM when we're like really clubbing and partying. And I, I think it worked out great for the wedding. Uh, they mixed in some Tiesto, they mixed in some Fisher, they mixed, mixed in some Avicii, and and it was the perfect mix of, of both of us. It was great. I, we got the wedding we wanted with our electronic band. <laughs> I love that. You know what? Like any event, I think there's a, there's a lot of pressure when it comes to weddings. And I genuinely see like when you choose the right music for yourself and your crowd, you just know. My friend last year, shout out to Amy Layton, for her wedding, they had something called Keely. Do you know what Keely is, Max? No. What's Keely? It's uh, okay. Everybody, dear listener, please don't hate me if I get it wrong. I think it's Scottish or Irish. That's where I get confused. But it's a type of dance. It's like a group dancing. And there's lots of, uh, of, of bands that come over. And what they do for your wedding, they will start playing Keely. And the beauty of it is that the music is quite, it's a bit of dropping my fist. That's why I think about Irish. But there's, there's that kind of upbeat sounds. But then there's also some kind of group dancing involved. But it's kind of fun. And it's even more hilarious when you have drunk people there because they just don't know what they're doing. And so they bump into each other and they get confused. It's really, really <laughs> cute. And it's really, really fun. It's, it's, it's something to be seen, but also it's something to be experienced. And I love that because I was talking to them about it and they were like, well, we just saw at somebody else's wedding and we just felt that would work with our crowd and ourselves because we wanted to enjoy it and we wanted our, you know, our people to enjoy it. And in the weirdest possible way, it's a great callback to actually 
the importance of knowing your people. And I think the more I've worked in marketing and the more I've been doing things, the more I've realized that you can never know your audience enough. You can never know your people enough. And again, thinking about these things like weddings and other events, I think in real life events can remind us so much about the online world because before the real life world was a big part of marketing and then everything shifted online. And so I still like to think about some of these big events that still happen and what they can teach us about marketing. To be honest, I'm talking to a great teacher of marketing because you are constantly sharing and looking for new data, new things, new tactics, new pieces of news, everything. So I have one (laughs) question. I would love for you to introduce us to obviously Marketing Max as what it is, but also what you do with your newsletters, which is how I got to meet you and got to know your work. And within that, I also have a question. How do you structure, obviously, the wealth of content that you share? Do you have a system? Do you save things? So we'd like you to tell us a bit more about that and also introduce kind of the newsletters and what you do within that. Yes. Yeah, so uh, I created the Marketing Max persona, brand, whatever you want to call it, two years ago. I founded my advertising agency in 2017 and built that up to 15 full-time employees working with more than 100 brands, managing millions and millions of dollars in ad spend for brands of all shapes and sizes. And after a few years of kind of lurking around on Twitter, I really decided to take it seriously and was inspired by Social Savannah, who created you know the Social Savannah per- persona on Twitter. And I was like, man, I'm just going to create Marketing Max. And ever since then, I don't really have a system or a content calendar or anything of the sort. It's me hopping into Twitter a couple times a day, tweeting out things that I think are interesting, tweeting out things I think are relevant, tweeting out things I think that will be helpful most of all to my audience and and to people on the platform. Uh, I've tried all sorts of different things, repurposing content on Instagram. And for the summer of, I guess it was 2021, summer 2021, I had a bet with one of my best friends from college who can get more TikTok followers that summer, me being Marketing Max and him being in his real estate niche, he sells like a, a real estate coaching program. And I and I got like 60,000 followers in two or three months and he got 100,000 followers in the same time zone. And so that kind of propelled the Marketing Max brand even higher. I really haven't touched it since then. But yeah, I mean, that's that's been the Marketing Max brand. And then when I sold my agency in 2021, Uh, I took a few months off and then I decided I was going to launch a course. I was like, this is the most obvious way to monetize my audience and to answer questions that I get all the time because I would get the same questions constantly in my Twitter inbox. You know, what's a good landing page template or what's a great ad design or, you know, how should I be thinking about my marketing funnel? And I was like, I give the same answers to everyone. Why don't I just put this all in a, in a course and sell the course? I launched the course, totally flopped. I think like 10 or 15 people bought it, literally. And I had 12 or 13,000 followers at the time. So I was a little surprised. My friend, my Twitter friend, Alex Garcia, big shout out to him. I always credit him with this, uh, reached out to me and was like, dude, like, how's the course going? And I was like, dude, it flopped. It, it, it's terrible. It just sucked. He said, you shouldn't launch a course. You should launch a newsletter. And I said, why? And he go, he walked through all of the reasons why and literally hung up with him on that call and bought the domain growthhacksweekly.com and launched a newsletter that following Sunday. I sent out the first one to a small list of, of emails that I'd just been collecting with some silly lead magnet I had on TikTok and some friends and family. And I started sending out one growth hack every single Sunday. So the concept was every Sunday I would email an industry agnostic growth hack that any company of any size in any any industry can use to grow their business. And it was going to be a different one every Sunday. After maybe six or so months, I got up to 15,000 subscribers. I had advertisers uh, who were booked out three months in advance. And I woke up and realized, you know, instead of trying to find my next business after selling my agency, is it going to be software? Is it going to be another agency? Is it going to be this? Is it going to be that? This business is doing well. I was making six figures uh, you know, ARR from a 15,000 subscriber newsletter that I was sending out once a week. And I was like, this is just a billboard business. I am booked up three months in advance. I just need more ad spots. I need more billboards to sell. So uh, at the end of last year, at the end of 2022, I came up with the idea to launch two daily newsletters. And January 2nd of this year, I launched two daily newsletters and I've grown what was originally one Sunday send to 15,000 people 
making you know probably a hundred to hundred fifty thousand bucks a year to now three newsletters that are well over half a million dollars a year in ARR. And so that's that's the business. I don't know if that was a ramble or if that answered all your questions, but that's the story of the inception of Marketing Max and you know how it has evolved from. Uh, you know, growing a Twitter audience from 10,000 people to now whatever it is, 40 plus thousand TikTok really propelled it. And uh, and then, yeah, the, the newsletter is now what I think most people on Twitter know me for or, or engage with the most. Because on, on any social platform, Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, you're only as good as the algorithm's ability to push you to your followers. And so typically, regardless of the platform, you're only going to get in front of 10 or 20% of your audience at any given time. If you have 100,000 followers on any platform, you're very lucky to have your post be seen by 20,000 people. Or if you have 100,000 subscribers on a newsletter, you should, in theory, have a good open rate around 50%. You're going to get in front of 50,000 people every time you create content. And so that's 30,000 extra people that are seeing your eyeballs having a newsletter versus having any sort of social presence. And so the goal very quickly for me, once I realized the value of that, switched from how do I get as many followers as possible to how do I push as many people from all these platforms to my newsletter as possible? And then now what I'm realizing, and I'll shut up going on a tangent and I apologize, but now what I'm realizing is the the kind of next step or the next evolution of social followers aren't as good as newsletter subscribers. Well, the next evolution of that is newsletter subscribers aren't as good as podcast listeners. So I'm launching my podcast this this Sunday. I don't know when this is airing, but yeah, I'm launching my podcast this Sunday. And so it's like, I'm always just trying to identify, you know, how can I reach my core target audience as often as possible with the most valuable content as possible? Harder to do that on social, easier to do that on newsletters, way easier to do that on podcasts. But uh, that's how I've been thinking about the evolution of marketing, max and creating content. First of all, never apologize for a tangent. We live for (laughs) tangents. We roll with tangents. Tangent is where is my safe space. And also the dear (laughs) listener who's been very, very loyal to us, 100% knows that that's where we live. So it's fine. And also there was so many golden nuggets within the tangents. So it's, it's all good. We're squirreling them away. I love two things that you mentioned earlier on. So thank you for that. The first thing that you mentioned was that kind of bet slash sprint to kind of grow your TikTok. And I think especially like when it comes to being busy as marketers and especially if it's somebody who is receiving your newsletters and potentially listen to the podcast by now, what you will know as well is that there are so many things to try, so many things to do, and it's hard to choose what to experiment next. So actually accountability, I think, is such a great reminder when it comes to obviously your community or fellow marketers or friends and be like, shall we try this? Or let's try this. That's what we do within our student community as well, because it works, your accountability works. So I love that. And also love that you didn't shy away from telling us about uh, the failure and the flop with the course, because I think what was interesting is that it kind of almost showed you that you basically monetized and grew the business by actually creating a community-based avenue. I know as you called as a billboard itself, but there's still to me more of a community feeling with newsletters and podcasts. Sadly, in a way, I guess, that there is with social media where the world, the first word is social. And you're like, well, why? Obviously, as you said, it algorithms pushing, you know, the interest within the platforms are called social media platforms. But I think it's really interesting what you mentioned that is like pivoting by thinking, okay, I'm going to try something different and then realizing that you get that attention. And as long as you provide the value, One thing that I also want to ask you and say, then we get into class in session, is also something that I've been thinking about recently, maybe after 15 years of being in marketing, which is actually what I love about you. And I promise this is not like a fangirling moment, but what I love about your newsletter is that it's clear what is for even the the growth daily is the other one that I get. So I get two out of three. Even that it's simple, you know, what you're getting is clear. And I think marketers, we're still balancing that idea of being clear instead of you know clever and i wonder whether you've seen that and i personally have seen it a lot by the way with the bro marketing kind of vibes but also with new marketers you know you want to try to look clever and i'm like honestly your audience just wants to know what's in it for them they want clarity they want something that it's valuable to them sometimes clever actually goes against being clear so i don't know what your thoughts are on that but that came up when i thought about how you approach the content that you create as well Yeah, I I think to your point, a lot of beginner marketers struggle with finding their voice. 
And so they try to be clever. They try to be cutesy. They try to stand out by doing something that maybe isn't true to the tone of voice that they have set out for themselves or the best tone of voice for their project or whatever it is that they're marketing, their product or product or whatever. My best advice on that front is just before you start marketing, you need to figure out your tone of voice. And if you don't know what that means, literally just Google it. There's tons of blog articles about it. Ask ChatGPT as lazy marketers would do. You know, it, it really just comes down to identifying what your tone of voice is. And the great advice on that front, Gary V says this a ton, right? You don't have to figure out what your personal brand is. You are the personal brand. If you're promoting your own brand, right? If, if you're promoting a different product, this doesn't necessarily work. But if you're promoting your own brand, just be yourself. And if you naturally are a little clever and a little cheeky and a little kitschy, then that's going to be your brand, right? And that's okay. Totally fine. But the fun part as a marketer comes from marketing a product that's not you or that's not the Marketing Max persona, right? It's like with the Marketing Max persona, it's a little bit more arrogant and a little bit more flashy and a little bit more braggadocious than who I am personally. But it's fun and people resonate with it and it solves its purpose and it creates a little bit of entertaining element or, or creates an entertaining element to it. Not crazy over the top, but like shit posting and to your point, like bro culture, but it, it really just comes down to figuring out what your tone of voice is. And, and when it's a product that becomes fun because you get to start from a blank slate and you get to work backwards from what your target audience will resonate with best, figuring out the balance between that tone of voice and how to stand out. Right. A perfect example of that is liquid death, right? Like completely out of left field, they have a clear tone of voice that stands out, but it's also something that their target audience can resonate with because of how unique and cheeky and different it is. Right. There's another company here in the States. I always see their commercials called uh, big ass fans. They create massive fans, like, like ceiling fans for warehouses and uh, you know, whatever. And their logo has a donkey because the donkey I think it's technically called an ass, right? I guess that's another name for donkey, but they're also big ass fans. So it creates this sense of like cheeky, creative nature, but that doesn't work in every single industry. That doesn't work for every single target audience that you go after. So, you know, you know, it, it's the probably the biggest thing that separates beginner marketers from pro marketers is pro marketers are really going to take that extra hour to do their research on who their target audience is, think through what they're most likely to respond to in terms of a tagline, in terms of a creator that they might partner with in terms of a Facebook ad, really take that extra hour really to do their research and think through what that is instead of just coming up with an idea saying, oh, this is clever, this is cheeky, or this is this works, you know, th this is something. And then just sending it out into the ether. Right? That what I that's what I would say is the biggest difference between those two. I love that you mentioned fun in that as well when it came to actually stepping away from, you know, your personal brand if you are working with clients or you're marketing a product. And I, I want to reiterate that. I mean, I, I will literally, one of our values is marketing should be fun. So human, impactful, accessible, inclusive, fun. And fun is so important because if you have fun with it, if you find pockets of, you know, cultivating your creativity and your curiosity and trying new things, as you say, and being bold, if you want to be bold, there's another Example of, um, you might correct me because I, I cannot get their name wrong all the time. The Million Dollar Shave Club or something like that? Or... Oh, Dollar Shave Club. Dollar Shave, dollar Club. shave Club. Yeah. And I just love their tone of voice because it's just leaning into it and it resonates with me. I probably wouldn't go as far as being like that, but we have a bit <laughs> of that. And I genuinely love that. And I think it's, you can see, and I wrote about it actually in my newsletter a while back, when you're having fun, especially if you are a small company, especially if you're a personal brand, your marketing will be more fun and your audience will see it. So it's like finding that balance between, yes, the tedious things, yes, the trial, less, yes, doing maybe things that are a bit different, but also inject a bit more fun in your life, please. And thank you because life is short and <laughs> the job of a marketer is long enough that if we don't have a bit of fun, then what's the point? That's just, that's just me. T take it for somebody who's been doing this for a very, very long time. <laughs> <laughs> and with that, <laughs> old woman chat, class in session. I'm very excited about this and not just because tactics is one of the things that you do. You can teach us anything, Max. So I'm going to give you a bit of a time constriction. So in about a minute or so. So let's see roughly how well can we do. What is the one thing that you can teach our students and our listeners related to your expertise and what you do and what you're passionate about in about a minute? What would that one thing be? I know you sent me this question yesterday, but I didn't have any time to think about it. So 
this is basically me being on the spot and coming up with something. One of the core values that I talk a lot about in my content is this concept of consistently getting in front of your target audience as much as you possibly can. The average website, whether it's an e-commerce store trying to sell a product or it's a agency's website that its main purpose is to generate leads, the average website has a 2% conversion rate meaning 98 out of every 100 people who land your website will not actually take the action you want them to take, purchase that product, fill out the form to become a lead, sign up for your marketing school, right? Whatever it is. The reason for that is because people don't walk into stores typically and walk out with something unless they've heard of the brand, researched the product, seen testimonials of other people using the product or wearing that product or eating that product or whatever it is. And so there was a study done a number of years ago that said the average person needs to see or hear your brand five times before they decide if they're going to purchase or not. That that study was done like 10 or 20 years ago. Now, some newer studies say that that number is closer to 15 times. But one of the things that I think a lot of marketers, whether you're a beginner or you're a pro, forget about a lot is this thing that I call the rule of fifths, right? Someone needs to see or hear your brand at least five times before they're even going to decide, yay or nay, if I'm going to purchase my product in that moment or in that kind of time in their life. The best thing that I think a lot of marketers can do is to stop focusing on necessarily reaching new customers and actually focus on reaching the people who have already heard about you, but haven't decided to purchase. And there's tons of ways that we can get into how to do that and some of the low hanging fruits to do that. But that's one of my main two or three core marketing beliefs, marketing principles is you need to consistently get in front of your target audience to even have the chance at selling. And you look at the biggest companies in the world, right? You look at Verizon, you look at Geico, you look at Disney, uh, you look at Nike. These brands spend billions of dollars a year consistently getting in front of you, consistently getting in front of you. Because the moment it's time for you to switch phone carriers, they want you to switch to Verizon. The moment you think I need insurance, the moment you think I need a pair of shoes to work out in, you immediately think of Nike, you immediately think of Geico, you immediately think of Verizon, at least in the States. There's a reason for that. It's not just because they've been around the longest. It's because they consistently get in front of their target audience more than all of their competitors. You consistently need to get in front of your, your target audience. So that's what I would say is, is uh, something that I think is fresh and I can help teach, even I don't like that word. <laughs> I absolutely love that. And the reason why I love that is because it's one of the little activities that I get to do. So we have a email marketing kind of workshop that is also on demand. But when I do it live, especially I've done it live for like six years for lots of students, also for companies and stuff. And I always ask how many interactions do you think it takes for people to take action? And there's actually a, a rule called the marketing rule of seven that comes from advertising in the 1930s. And from that study, from that rule, it's based on billboards. So we're going back to the 1930s, obviously. And he said it took seven interactions. So what you were saying that really resonates with me. And when I do the activity and I ask students to guess when it's the live one, and we were like, oh, three, four times, you know, just as a gut feeling. And then I get them to, before I give them the answer, and as you said, rightfully so, it's not seven or five anymore, it's probably 15 uh, or like 10, 15 or even 20 sometimes. But then when I get them to think before I give them the answer, I think we then reflect what you just talked about. And I think is that switching the mentality of being like, you think it's going to be once or twice because you talk about your damn brand or product all day. So you're like, I already talked about this all day, every day. Why do people not com commit? But then you kind of switch yourself back again, like into that mentality of being like, yeah, but I consume a lot of content myself as a consumer. And the people that are really, you know, take action on are the people that I've been following for a while. I get their emails, I listen to the podcast. Why? Because I trust them. And I think, so as well as the practical implications, which I'll get to, because we talked about some lower anger and fruit and I want to scoop about a few. There's one that comes to mind, which I want to ask if that's a big one, but I just wanted to reiterate here before I get to that, the importance of actually sometimes going back into being our audience's shoes, just to reframe the mindset. Cause I think this mindset shift, as you say, then helps us refining our funnels or just, you know, reshifting our focus. But instinctively we still think, well, I talk about this all the time. People will know. And actually brand awareness it feels it's so much about getting new people in all the time that we forget about almost that consideration piece and the importance of it becoming almost the new brand awareness when it comes to the focus that we should put into it. So on that note, talking about low hanging fruit, one of the ones that I thought about that I wanted to ask you about is ads. 
and kind of like the power of targeting and retargeting in different ways. So ads is one that came about. Is that one of them? And what would be another one that you can think of when it comes to, again, this consideration piece, this this group of people that we can really nail, but we're like, how do I actually do that? Yeah. One of the things I preach when I talk about the constant need to remind people you exist is ads. You're, you already hit the nail on the head. I call it a $5 a day retargeting campaign. If you simply set up the Facebook pixel on your website and you allocate $5 a day to a campaign on the Facebook ads platform, meta ads platform, whatever it runs ads on, on Facebook and Instagram. Uh, basically, every time someone lands in your website, the next time they open up Instagram, they are likely to see your ad. And the ad doesn't necessarily have to have to be a strong call to action, and it doesn't have to have you know a sale or anything to pitch. It could literally just be a testimonial video, right? Sometimes that works the best because, to your point, you, you said the word consideration, right? Three steps in the funnel: awareness. Where do people first discover your product or your brand? Consideration, right? They're considering whether or not they should buy it. And then the actual purchase, the conversion, everyone focuses on one and three. Everyone forgets number two. And so in that number two phase, right, how do we get them to consider us more often? Well, number one, we need to be in front of them more often, right? It's simple math. If you're, if you see, if it's like the same pen company and you just see more ads of the pen company selling the exact same pen, you're more likely to purchase them. So frequency, right? How often they see you in that consideration period is great, but also testimonials are the strongest way to convince someone to choose you over someone else. You need to create proof. If there's two coffee shops and there's a line out the door for one and the other one has crickets, you're probably going to want to go to the one that has the line out the door unless you're in a crazy rush. There's examples like this in literally every single industry, like left and right. There's examples of this everywhere, but absolutely the easiest, easiest way to increase your revenue, increase your brand awareness, improve your middle of the funnel, your consideration period is to run what I call a $5 a day retargeting campaign. Literally $150 a month is all it can take if you set the objective to impressions, right? You're not trying to get clicks. You're not trying to get people to click on that and then purchase a product. You're literally just trying to remind them you exist in a way that establishes your credibility or in a way that establishes your value proposition or in a way that establishes your unique selling proposition, right? Why you're better than your competitors. And it's literally just the impression. You're literally just paying to remind people you exist, to remind people why you're better, to remind people why they should purchase from you without asking for something, without saying, click here to purchase, click here to sign up, click here to do this. You're not asking for anything. You're simply reminding them. That is one of the most effective ways to move the needle, especially for smaller brands. Uh, and this could work for, for a marketing agency, right? That, you know, 100 people land your website every month. If 50 of those people are potential customers, get a video of your number one client saying, hey, you know, I worked with Johnny and he helped me grow my business X, Y, Z. That's cool. It works for e-commerce brands, right? Dedicate some percentage of your monthly ad spend to ads that don't even have a button or at least aren't even optimized for clicks, just literally impressions, trying to get as many views on a video as, as possible. Right, could be a testimonial video, could be a fun commercial that you hire a little agency to shoot. That's cute and fun. It goes back to your tone of voice, right? If your tone of voice is unique and different, just establishes you as, as something different, right? If you're a, a restaurant, absolutely remind them, hey, you know, we have 500 five star reviews on Yelp, right? Or maybe maybe, maybe it's a taste test video. You send, stand up a, a table in the middle of a local park and you have people do a blind taste test. Like the, the possibilities are endless, but it works for every single brand and. I truly, truly, truly believe every single brand should have at least a $5 a day retargeting campaign uh, live on, on meta ads. One of the things that I love about what you mentioned, and thank you so much for saying, and yes, I did take notes myself, even if <laughs> I think I read it from you before. So, but you know, like repetition, as you said, is the mother of skills, literally. But one of the things that I love about what you're doing, which I encourage everybody to learn, and now any graduate from our certification is going to roll their eyes because they know what I'm going to say, is the fact that you actually thought about how to apply to different industries and products. And obviously this is part of what you do again, if, you know, newsletter subscribers of yours will know that, but I think it's such a powerful skill. And this is why in our certification, we do this all the time. We get them to do small exercises with random case studies, because I want you to think outside the box, because that will also help you, in my opinion, think about 
your brand or your product or your clients ideas for them by just thinking, what would I do if I was helping this? And it's a muscle. And at first, I'll be honest, our students hate it. But then they start to understand it because I explain why we do that. And back to that point, one more thing I want to say, because this was great advice and great practical knowledge. Also, going back to like being mindful of how we think. When we do our final plan at the end of the eight weeks and the, they create a marketing plan, the amount of time that I have to shake my lovely, lovely students, I love you so much. I have to shake them and be like, I love that you're adding so much about brand awareness and conversion is great. But loyalty and advocacy for me are huge. Obviously, what we do, like relationship driven funnels are what we do. So I'm like, what about these guys? And then I'm like, and what about consideration? So I just want to say, I see again and again, we've done five cohorts now. I see it all the time is natural for us to think about things like brand awareness and conversion. And I appreciate that. But I always have to remind whenever I'm reviewing some of the decks, where are those pieces? What are we going to do for that? And often I find that we fall into the brand awareness again. And I'm like, no, 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 no. We're not talking to new people right now. I want you to talk to your people, the ones you already have, what we're going to do with them. So just want to say one more time, it's also a mindset shift. And uh, it's okay if you think oh, this makes sense. But honestly, it will take you a bit of practice to remind yourself, am I thinking about these people? Am I actually doing the right things to be in front of them? Because it happens all the time. Thank you for that. That's a practical way to do that. So I love that. Talking about strategies, can you think of one strategy or framework that you learned from someone else that really stood out to you? Something that you found in your big findings and trailing around the YouTube webs? That I learned from someone else. I launched my agency with a co-founder. And the original concept was I knew very little about marketing other than my little experience with Facebook ads. And he knew way more about Facebook ads than I did. So I brought him on as a co-founder. He knew a lot about Facebook ads, but he also knew a ton about Google ads. I still believe that Google ads are the number one marketing and customer acquisition channel for most brands, I would say. Some, every brand, it either absolutely crushes and it's going to be your best channel or it's going to be the worst and you shouldn't even spend time, energy or money on it. For the brands that it works for, Google Ads is by far and away the best channel. From him, I learned this framework, strategy, whatever you want to call it for Google Ads, which he calls the hyper-relevant low-volume keyword strategy. I'll break this down. Hyper-relevant, meaning if you're, if you're selling running shoes, you're competing against Nike, you're competing against Adidas. If you were to bid on best running shoe, it's going to be very expensive to bid on that term. There's a lot of people bidding on that term. There's a lot of people searching for that. It's a sought after keyword. Google's going to jack up the rates of that term. But what you want to do is you want to look for keywords that people might be typing into Google that are hyper relevant to your specific product, even though they have low volume, even though there's less people searching for it. If it's hyper relevant to your product, the majority of people who are searching for that are going to have a higher chance of actually purchasing your product than just Googling best running shoe. So we look for oftentimes longer phrases when doing this, but sometimes it's shorter. It could be uh, instead of just best running shoe, maybe you make the best women's running shoe. Maybe you bet, maybe you make the best running shoe for, uh, that's also a hiking shoe for like mountain running. Maybe the keyword is best shoe for running on mountains or best running shoe for hikes. Significantly less people are Googling that low volume, but it's hyper relevant to your specific product. You have to figure out why your product or why what your target audience is going after, why they might be interested in, in your particular product. Hyper relevant, low volume keywords is by far and away the best thing that I've ever learned from anyone else in terms of an actual strategy. You know, beyond that, I think it's a lot of like general marketing strategy, funnel things. Yeah, the, the, the best, best, best far and away strategy I've ever taken that's given the most amount of results for my businesses and my clients' businesses is this concept of hyper-relevant, low-volume keywords. And I can go into examples in every single industry, but yeah, that's, that's the best. And it's very different from the consideration piece we were talking about earlier, but they can kind of work in conjunction, right? Because if you're running a Facebook ad and in your Facebook ad, you say, we are the best running shoe for mountain runs or for hiking, you want to bid on that keyword. That way, the moment someone is like, oh, yeah, I do go on runs and I often do it on a hike or in, you know, in the mountains, right? They're going to Google like, I wonder what other ones exist. And if you don't bid on that term, you're missing out on a huge opportunity. So all of the strategies work in concert together. But yeah, that, that's the strategy I've, I've learned that from, learned from someone else that's 
had the most impact on me. You know what I love about this is that even if you're new to Google ads, there's actually a bit of a lesson in, in we call it search intent, SEO mm -hmm. kind of, and I know you'll be like, well, obviously all SEO is search intent if you know what search engine optimization is. However, once again, when we do our certification, we do have a workshop about this and there's a little exercise, which I'm not going to spoil, but in that exercise, I'm actually proven once again, right. The lovely Kalila teaches this class, shout out to Kalila. Students still think that they're thinking about the user intent, but as you say, we will often go for the, what's the you know best running shoes as a keyword for our homepage or things like this. Once again, reminding that actually the hyper relevance, it's so powerful when it comes to any sort of intent, because that's where you can really get a fighting chance to be seen. So I just want to say, this is great if you double into ads, but even if you're just like, I don't know if I'm there yet, honestly, the first part of it, the low volume makes a thousand percent sense is obviously when it comes to bidding as well, but even just the first part of it, it can be so relevant when it comes to also just organic search if you are just dabbing into those waters. So absolutely love that. Now, my final question from class and session before I go into quick fire is actually about, it can be about work. It can also be about life. What <laughs> is one thing that you recently unlearned, Max, that has improved your life or your work? Uh, yeah, I, I think recently I've had a lot of breakthroughs as an entrepreneur, less so marketing, less so life, but just entrepreneurship. I've always been chasing easier business models and easier businesses. Uh, I ran an agency for five years. I got very burnt out, client stress, team stress, everything else. And I said, man, I want to go do software because software is easier and there's less headaches and there's less stress. Then I was like, you know what? I want to do e-com. E-com has less stress. I don't have to get on the phone to sell people, whatever. This concept, like the grass is always greener. There, there's easier ways to make money. There's easier businesses to sell. There's easier ways to make an impact. And one of the biggest things that I've learned recently is, or I should say unlearned, given your question, is every business is hard, truly. There's no business that's easier than others because there's shit in every single business. There's really awful things that happen and there's downsides and there's risk in everything. It really just comes down to which problems are easier for you to solve given your experience and given the things that don't bother you as much. It really comes down to which problems you choose to solve. So if you have a, a client or sorry, if you have a client service agency or if you're a freelancer, the problems that you're solving are very customer service centric, right? Yes, your work is marketing potentially, right? Your work may be Facebook ads, but at the end of the day, the problems that you're solving are much more client focused. The client's not happy with the performance or the client's not happy with the creative that you made and they want to change the landing page copy. And so the problem that you end up solving is much more human re related. If you are in e-com, right, you might, you might be dealing with inventory issues. You might be dealing with forecasting issues. Some people might love projections and spreadsheets and dealing with inventory issues. Some people are people people and they love dealing with people and they love figuring out that. And so that's probably been the biggest lesson that I've unlearned recently is simply every business sucks. It's just a matter of what problems you want to solve that are going to still let you get a good night's sleep every night. I love that final bit. Um, there's also something that I want to add, and I love what you said in there first about obviously understanding, it's almost understanding your strengths is that combination of yes, understand your purpose and your passions, and I want to say this, but also I think what's very relevant here is understanding that you can still change the how. You can still make an impact in a specific field or fulfill a specific mission or vision that you have, but maybe you shift how you go about it by actually shifting the business model, the type of business that you run. If you want to make an impact when it comes to social impact, you can do it in different ways depending on your strengths. And I think that's where it goes back to is problems that suck less is also what are your strengths. I find that for me, like some of the things that I love doing all day, I genuinely could create Notion templates for hours. And I do because now we sell them. Why do we sell them? Because our students love them and I love creating them. And I know that they use them and I know that they get results. And it's something that I know that, yes, it has, as you say, like everything else is an element in the side of the business that has its snags and has these things. But for me, that comes easy. So there are some things you will have to do that are going to be hard anyway. But if, as you say, if you know that it's something that you can still handle, and I think it's that balance between 
understanding that there might be a time where you want to delegate, but I find that if you're going to delegate 99% of your business because you don't love doing any of it, it's going to be hard because at some point you'll still have to face the problems that is going to arise. And that's still something that you're going to face. Even if you delegate 99.9% of it, I mean, first of all, what's left <laughs> for you to do or enjoy? But, you know, so I love that. And I think it's a great reminder in anything, especially even if you're just choosing your specialism in your marketing career or if you are choosing company to work for, that is still something like even within your role, can you identify what you love? So I think it's a lesson that is valid for us as entrepreneurs and anybody that wants to actually, you know, work and at least enjoy and feel like, as you say, like they know how to take the next step. So thank you for that. Now for a little bit of a spin after this very deep moment, it's quick fire. And quick fire means quick. Derp. And what it means as well is that we're going to have two options. I'm going to give you max and you're going to choose which one you're going to keep in the this okay. or that. Are we ready? Sure. Spotify playlist or podcast? Spotify playlist. Excellent start. Voice notes or texts? Text, but I think voice notes are extremely underrated. Oh, okay. Very interesting. We actually recently had an interview where there was a very lengthy explanation about why, why text notes are actually very, very bad. So I want to hear now why are they underrated instead? We're having a bit of an interesting shift there. <laughs> yeah, everyone hates voice notes, but I think they're fantastic. Uh, I think it's like a voice mail. You can read it on your own time and you can speed up the playback and for the right thing. And sometimes it's just easier to ramble. Uh, sometimes I'd rather just listen to someone say something than have to like skim through a long text of blocks and blocks and blocks and blocks. Yeah, I think they're really underrated. Love I it. use them in my team all with my team all day. I think it's a lot about perspective as well, and I love that you mentioned that. I just want to add, if somebody listened to you know one of the last interviews and is like, oh yeah, I think also what is important what resonates with you and your team, especially if you use it, but even with your friends, is just understanding what works for you and them. And I like to be able to do that and understand or kind of, you know, try to figure out or even ask people like what's their preferred method of communication or what works for them. And then if I find that it matches, that's great. Uh, because obviously there are some people that enjoy them and they don't. And I think when somebody enjoys it, then it kind of makes everything smoother. So that's an excellent point yeah. there. Next one. Carousels or Reels? Reels. TikTok or YouTube? YouTube. More business content. Ooh. Most dopamine. Nice. Can speed up the playback time. <laughs> <laughs> the playback time is a big seller, isn't it? <laughs> I, I love listening to... That's why I love EDM, right? Like, faster the better. Podcasts, audiobooks, 1.5, 2x speed. Depending on who's reading it. Uh, helps me consume content way better. So yeah, I wish I could live my life at 1.5x speed. I will not lie. I mean, this is not going to be shocking for anybody, but I listen to most things at 1.5 speed. And yeah. you should see the face of my husband when I listen to Italian voice notes at 1.5 speed. It literally <laughs> sounds like it's madness. It sounds like, Too like you know, when you do the reverse Beatles <laughs> thing, when we all say like you do the reverse Beatles album thing, it's literally the same. Um, so, so yeah, I, I'm, I'm with you on that one. I am the kind of person that listens to things fast because I just get the information fast and I get to it. Um, <laughs> two more newsletter or Twitter or X. Oh, it's hard from a business standpoint. It's newsletters from building an audience standpoint, it's absolute newsletters from just like a love for it's definitely X or Twitter. It's, uh, I, I spend probably two hours a day on Twitter. I, I freaking love it. It's like home to me i can't imagine my life without it <laughs> love it last but not least memes or gifts gifts love gifts love gifts i send them in my slack channel to my team all day every day oh good okay the thing is if some when people say memes i'm like yep yeah, get it they're still really cool but gifts are a special <laughs> place to my heart so that makes me always happy when somebody chooses it it's like it's like a little like team gift and then i just kind of want to squeal so excellent. it's just a I'm meme at 1.5 x speed that's why we love it so much. <laughs> there is a trend there there is a theme okay now it makes a lot more sense now it makes a lot more sense like the, the, the amount of office kind of gifts that i have that i can just use at the right moment is insane Anyway, gift banks for the win. Max, last question before we wrap it up is, again, going back to something, a very powerful power that somehow you've been, it's been bespoke on you and we don't know why, but you have the power to send one message. You can broadcast, broadcast one message, there we go, into everybody's phone. 
And if you could do that, if you could broadcast said message, what would that message say? I think it would be as cheesy as this sounds. I think it would be one word and it would just be smile. Obsessed. That's all it is. Like you said it earlier, life, life's short and uh, smile is, is the real drug. It's the real dopamine. So just smile. Maybe smile more with a smile emoji. Maybe that's the message, but yeah, you get the point. I love that. Amazing. Well, with that said, if people want to smile more with you, that sounds interesting. Uh, where should they go? Let us I'm, know I'm a bit about what I'm you're married. up to. That's, that's a weird comment. Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was thinking about it. I was like, mm, nah. <laughs> where should people go? If people want to get in contact with me, you can just find me on Twitter at Marketing Max uh, or TikTok or Instagram or literally any social platform at Marketing Max. My newsletter is growthdaily.com. And growth marketing, but growthdaily.com. Thanks for having me on. Happy to smile with everyone. <laughs> <laughs> we went there again. Thank you so much for being here with us <laughs> one more time. Thank you so much, Max, for being here. As always, we'll be back next time with what ways to market to hearts and make marketing fun, as we said today. But in the meantime, class dismissed. <laughs>